My name is Russ Gash. Uh, I'm a research plant physiologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service here in Morris, Minnesota. And so I'm going to be talking with Dr. Scotty Wells, who's a, a extent, forage extension agronomist uh, with the uh, University of Minnesota. And we're going to be talking about the use of winter oil seeds, winter camelina, and pennycress as uh, cover crops, winter annual cover crops, that can also be harvested as, as a cash crop. And because of the, the nature of their short life cycle, it allows us some options, even this far north, for uh, double and relay cropping, so growing two crops in a single season. So pennycress and, and winter camelina are both mustard species, brassicas. So they belong to the same plant family as canola. They're closely re related to canola. Uh, because of that, they have relatively high seed oil content. Uh, winter camelina, a bit higher than pennycress. Uh, typically, we see a high uh, oil content of around 35 to 42 percent. They're both winter and spring varieties of, of both camelina and, and pennycress. Uh, most, as far as camelina, most people are more familiar with the, the spring types than the winter types. But our interest is in the winter types from the standpoint of cover crops and also the double cropping biz, which I'll be talking about here in a minute. Both have very good winter survivability. We typically plant, try, try to get these established in, in late August uh, through all the way up to, to mid-October. Uh, they can be planted. Uh, as long as they make it out of the soil, like I said, they're in crit, they have very good free survivability. Uh, we've seen plants, even small plants that get out of the ground before freeze up, they'll, they'll still survive typically survive our winters. If we're drill seeding it, uh, we typically use from six to 10 pounds per acre. So this is a little high here, and I think that's why we're seeing lodging in this stuff here. Typically, camelina is, is pretty, good, pretty good resistance to lodging, but this was a pretty heavy stand here. Typically, uh, we're harvesting those in, in mid to late June, um, pennycress being a little bit earlier. The uses for the oil, Camelina can be used for food uses as well as industrial uses. Has very high uh, alpha linolenic acid content, which is omega-3 fatty acid, so it's a heart healthy oil. Uh, one of our industrial partners, uh, General Mills, is very interested uh, in camelina. And we're working with industrial partners side by side to help develop markets for these crops. There aren't big markets out there right now, and that's something that farmers always ask, so I'll be very upfront with you. There's mom and pop markets for camelina. There's no markets right now for pennycress. And there are some bigger markets for camelina for biofuels uh, purposes. Some of you may or may not know this, but camelina oil has actually been used for uh, making jet fuel, which has ASTM standards uh, as good, if not better, than petroleum-based jet fuel. Jet fuel's different than, uh, than biodiesel. It's more of a kerosene-type-based fuel. and. Uh, Mil both military and commercial flights have been flown on, on camelina jet fuel, green jet fuel. Pennycress at the present time, because it's, it has a high uricic acid content in its oil, uh, that's a non-edible oil, and it also has glucosinolates in it, which make it non-edible, but it can be used for industrial purposes. Um, so it has, has very good uses, and has also been proven to be a good oil for making biodiesel as well. Pennycrest oil, that is. So, but camelina again, both food and and um, and uh, industrial uses. Because of the the short life cycle of these, it, like I said, it allows us some options uh, of double and what is called relay cropping. Now, most of you are probably familiar with double cropping, right? You grow your first crop, you harvest it, you put your second crop in, you grow that to maturity and harvest it. Some of those things we can do here in Minnesota with pennycrest and camelina at least with short season uh, crops like edible beans, uh, millet, even sunflower we found works good. And soybean to some extent works, uh, works well for double cropping also, but gets better as we move further south than where we are right now. Uh, in our region, what we've found works best, and we've been keying in on soybean because of the economics and also because of the fact that if we're gonna impact a lot of acres, we need to get this incorporated into corn and soybean systems. Soybean works very well in what's called a relay cropping system. The easier system, however, is like I said, after a small grain cereal, short season like spring wheat, we come in here, we drill, uh, seed our, our winter camelina, or pennycrest for that matter, in late August, 
or September, in the September. That comes up uh, in a rosette. It'll stay a rosette over winter. It lays dormant uh, as a rosette. And then again, in the spring, it starts growing. And in fact, uh, it'll start growing really early. Sometimes even before the snow is all, all melted, you'll see green tissues, you know, starting to grow. And before it bolts, so it bolts like canola, bolts and then it begins to flower and set seed. Just at the time it's beginning to bolt, or, or even a little bit before, we're going in here and we're seeding soybean in between rows of camelina. In this system, we've been doing it on 30 inch rows, planting, uh, drilling the soybean in. Another thing that's worked well for us is to use skip rows. And we do this using like a Penn State interseeder. What it allows us to do is to plant the, uh, plant the cover crop, but leave a skip row, in this case, every 30 inches. And then we're coming in here and drilling our soybean. So that soybean then comes up by early June. The camelina is pretty much done flowering. Uh, uh, by early June, starts flowering. Sometimes it starts flowering as early as early May. And it's already setting seed too. So at that time, you know, the soybean are still quite small. Camelina's up here. By mid to late June, when we're harvesting it, most of that seed in the camelina is in the upper third to half of the plant. And the soybean are still quite small. So we can come over the top of that soybean with little or no damage to the soybean and harvest our camelina. This it gives a good representation of the height differential there, which allows us to allows us to do that. So with this system, we're able to to produce uh, a much higher total grain and oil uh, yield production. For the grain, uh, you know, I want to key in on these three bars here. This is uh, for a relay cropping system. We have tried double cropping, which works, but it doesn't work quite as well as the relay cropping system uh, for bumping up or getting good soybean yields. Uh, with the relay system, we're able to produce higher soybean yields than, than with the double crop. And part of the reason for, for that is, is just getting in, planting at a more normal time than in the double crop system. But anyway, with that system, we uh, total the camelina plus the soybean uh, seed yield. We can get a, a higher grain, total grain yield, and a much higher total oil yield as compared to a full season monocrop soybean. Uh, soybean crop. This is some of our original work, which was done a few years ago. Uh, since then, we've been researching uh, with using different cultivars of soybean for this system, different maturity groups, and also planting dates. And we've been able to, last year, for instance, on a relay system, we were producing 52 bushel uh, soybean, and the monocrop was 55 bushel. So we we're getting pretty close. With this type of system, you've got some, obviously you've got some competition, so you're never going to get quite 100% of your full season soybean. But you have to remember, we're looking at the yields of both crop, crops combined. With that, as far as economics, um, using a, a, a price per pound for camelina seed that one would get if they were selling it for biofuel, or for use as biofuel, which is lower than what we expect for, uh, for food use, uh, but using 18 cents a pound, and current soybean prices, we're able to, to increase the, the economic return of that system by about $130 to $150 an acre. By adding that, uh, that extra economic return and a new market that they can tap into, um, they tend to be more interested in, in giving, uh, giving a cover crop a try.